One evening I was sitting at our table looking over my daughter Katie's medical forms. Katie was getting ready to start kindergarten, so the pediatrician gave her a full physical. While my wife left her school forms laying out on the table. I glanced at it lazily and saw the letter that ended my marriage. In the column blood type. It was written A. I froze for about 10 seconds a minute. I have no idea. I then went to the cabinet and pulled out two sheets of paper from our medical records. Everything was exactly as I remembered. Last summer, my wife and I donated blood to the Red Cross, which gave each of us a receipt indicating our blood type. Here it is on two sheets of paper. Mine is B, hers is O. So there was no way Katie could be my daughter. If my wife was her mother and I saw Marie give birth to her, then someone with a type I had to be the father. The children were already asleep. Marie was upstairs watching TV. I took a beer out of the refrigerator and sat in the backyard thinking, how did my marriage go? I'd say, okay. Pretty typical. Both good and bad. Depends on what day you ask. When we were dating and in the early months of our marriage, Marie and I were passionately in love. We made love all the time, sometimes madly, and even outside of bed. We constantly touched each other, holding hands, walking hand in hand, stroking each other's neck or back as we passed by. Of course, after some time, it faded away. Doesn't that happen in every marriage? But now, with proof of her infidelity hitting me right between the eyes, everything I had ever thought about our marriage was on the rocks. I sat and thought, what changed? Gradually or suddenly? It seemed like both. The slowdown in our sex life was gradual for a while. But about six years ago, a few months before Katie was conceived, there were a few strange months. Marie, my open and loving wife, was acting very strange. One evening she returned from work quite late, briefly, allowed me to kiss her tenderly, immediately went to the shower and avoided me for the rest of the evening. The next morning was just as cold and unceremonious. But that night she became completely different. She came home early, cooked a special dinner, put me to bed early, and lovingly had sex with me with an eagerness and passion that I thought we had lost. We hugged happily before going to bed. And Marie told me how much she loved me. Several more times this week we had passionate sex. Then the cold night soon happened again. She returned late from work, didn't say a word to me, and quickly took a shower. For the next two months, I hardly knew who I married. Marie was passionate and loving. Marie was cold. Marie was attentive. Marie was distant and preoccupied. Marie was patient. Marie was obnoxious and hot-tempered. I asked her several times if anything had happened, Ned, if something between us was bothering her, if there were problems at work. But the only response I received was, I don't know, Bill. I'm probably just a little nervous. Sorry. When things finally got back to normal after three months or so, it was much less pleasant than at the beginning of our marriage. Marie became less moody, but she was almost never sweet and loving anymore, and her interest in sex seemed to disappear. We made love no more than once a week, sometimes no more than once every two weeks. And only when I asked quite firmly... Any gentle request, such as perhaps we could fool around tonight, was met with sharp refusal. I had to seriously point out how long it had been since we did this. Marie would then have sex with me, but in a way that would make it clear that she was just doing me a favor. Do all marriages follow such a sad pattern? It was the only marriage I knew well, so I couldn't tell. Of course, I wondered what was going on, and my thoughts included the possibility of an affair. But soon after, Marie became pregnant and our shared excitement about the future baby and the joy of having our wonderful Katie crowded out most of my worries about our marriage. After Katie was born, Marie and I were constantly tired, so her lack of interest in sex was easier to understand, although I still wasn't happy about it. 
And when Katie turned three, Marie became pregnant again and we had Brian just after Katie's fourth birthday. So Bill and Marie, lovers and spouses, became Bill and Marie, parents of two wonderful, exhausting children. We both adored our children. And although I now realize that he was deeply unhappy with the state of our marriage and our virtual lack of sex life, I didn't realize it at the time. And if so, then I just decided that all couples with small children go through this now. Armed with the shocking knowledge that my daughter was not mine. The events of six years ago did not seem so mysterious, Marie must have started an affair around then. This explained the cold and the sudden rush to the shower. The passionate sex and warm affection in the days that followed could be chalked up to guilt or even if I was being merciful to a determination to keep her marriage happy by continuing the affair. As I sat in the yard watching the darkness fall and the stars grow brighter, my inner shock gave way to growing anger. My loving wife not only cuckled at me, but also gave me someone else's child to raise. And maybe not just one. Maybe Brian wasn't mine either. If at that moment I was only thinking about punishing Marie, I would have burst into the house, shown her blood-type evidence, forced her to confess, and thrown the lying bitch out onto the street. But it was difficult. I adored my children, whether they were biologically mine or not. If we divorce, Mary will most likely get sole custody. Once it turns out they're not mine. I sat and thought. I asked it the question, what do I want? And the answers were surprisingly clear. First, I want to know exactly what Marie did. Was it a short novel? Doesn't she even know that Katie isn't my child? Or does she know everything and has been sleeping with some guy behind my back for many years? And secondly, I want to raise my children as my own and never let them know that I am not their father. Once I knew what my goals were, planning how to get there seemed surprisingly easy. I returned to the house and found cotton swabs entering each of the children's rooms. I carefully took a swab from the inside of each of their cheeks without waking them, and wrapped each one separately. I gave Katie a two and Brian a three. Then he went down to the kitchen, put a tampon on his cheek, and marked it with one. I had a friend who worked in a chemistry lab at a university, and I arranged for him to test the DNA for me. This was the first step, the beginning of collecting information. When I received my first response, I knew what I would do next. A week later, my friend called me. He didn't know whose samples they were. I told him that I had met people with the same last name. And we were trying to figure out if we were distant relatives. Hi, Bill. He said, your two and three are definitely relatives. They are brothers and sisters, but your one is not related to any of them. I guess these people aren't your cousins after all. I thanked him and hung up. So Katie and Brian were brother and sister. Meaning they had the same parents. Marie had two children with this mysterious idiot. But did she know about this? Obviously she knew she was sleeping with this guy. But did she know he was the father of our children? There was an easy way to find out. I went to the kitchen where Marie was washing the dishes. Honey, I want to ask you something. I began. Without turning around, she told me to go ahead, and I continued. A work colleague of mine has a biologist friend who is doing some DNA research, and he needs samples from people who are related. I told him that I would take swabs from you, from me, and from each of the children. Now I'll take care of each of the children before bed, and then you and I will take care of ours later, okay? I watched Marie very carefully as I told my story. Halfway through, she tensed up and almost dropped the pan she was washing. Then she came to her senses and continued to wash herself. When I finished speaking, there was silence for a minute, and then she turned around and looked at me. I'm not sure I like this idea, Bill. How do we know what this biologist is going to do with the samples? Or whether our information will be kept confidential? I started to disagree with her, but she literally flew at me. No, I'm just not enthusiastic about this idea. 
Please tell your colleague that we do not want to participate. Okay, honey, I said softly. In any case, it's okay. Her reaction told me everything I needed to know. My next step was to find out everything I could about her affair or love affairs. Who, where and when, maybe even why, I wasn't sure, but it was entirely possible that Marie had something hidden somewhere in her house. That would give me a clue. But I need time to search everything thoroughly. That Saturday, we were planning to go to her parents' house to spend the afternoon there. A few minutes before we were supposed to leave, I went into the bedroom, called our home on my cell phone, then picked up the phone and pretended to be talking to my boss at work. Having finished, I approached Marie. Honey, I'm very sorry. There's a crisis at work, and today they absolutely need me, at least for four hours. Otherwise, the company will have serious problems. Damn it, Bill, my parents are looking forward to meeting their children. I know, I said soothingly. I'm really sorry, you go. Just apologize. You and the kids will have a good time. I'll make myself some dinner, and I'll see you in the evening. She accepted this change in plans without further objection and was soon sitting in the car with the children. Now I had several hours to systematically search the house. I decided that there was little point in looking in the house and the places where I usually go, since Marie was unlikely to hide anything there. So I skipped the kitchen, bookshelves, in the living room, etc. I also ignored my bedroom and bathroom parts, but thoroughly checked all of her closet parts and dresser drawers. All that surprised me was a pair of very sexy pieces of lingerie that I had never seen her wear. They were hidden far away in the back corner under everyday things, so she didn't want me to know about them. Only the children's rooms and the attic remained. Deciding that children's rooms were less likely, I climbed into the attic. There were various old and long-forgotten pieces of furniture, a couple of lamps, and several boxes of books and things that predated our wedding. It was too much to check, so I took a closer look. First, I noticed that one of the three boxes to the side looked less dusty than the others. Looking at them more closely, I saw that they had been lifted and moved more recently than the rest of the attic junk, which apparently had not been touched for years. So I devoted my attention to these three boxes and found everything I was looking for. These were all Mary's old things, mostly letters from friends and acquaintances from her college days. Also, I found a bunch of letters and souvenirs for myself, sweet greeting cards and things like that. Quite far down at the bottom of one of the boxes, apparently designed to be hidden by old papers, lay a thin stack of more recent notes and two videotapes. I pulled them out. The cassettes had no labels. The notes were from Harry, and they were brief but overtly erotic. I took the tapes and tapes downstairs to take a closer look. Twenty minutes with a stack of notes told me almost everything I needed to know. Marie cheated on me with Harry, her boss at the office where she worked. The affair began, it seemed to me, about three months before Katie was conceived, just at the time when Marie was behaving so strangely and erratically at home. All the notes were from Harry to Marie, and they were rough and strong. There was no love in them, but there was a lot of lust. From the beginning, the relationship seemed almost dominant, submissive, with Harry bossing it around. Some notes told her how to dress for a certain occasion. In others, he described exactly how they would have sex the next time they worked late. A couple of notes congratulated her on the birth of their children and scornfully called me a poor fool who, without knowing it, was raising them for him. It was clear that he did not intend to report his children. I knew that he was happily married to a sweet woman named Caroline, and they had three children of their own. Apparently, Caroline was as unaware of his affair as I was. My jaw clenched as I read. It was clear that Harry was dominating Marie, but she agreed to it voluntarily. There was no hint of rape or blackmail. She seemed to enjoy playing this role for him and being told what to do. Moreover, it was obvious that they both knew who the father of Mary's two children was, and it seemed that both of them enjoyed the secret knowledge they had over me. 
From these notes, I could not learn anything about Marie. But now there was no longer any doubt that she had been fooling me for more than six years and deliberately giving birth to children from another man pretending to be my loving wife. I had been full of anger for days, but these notes brought it to a boil. My plans for revenge in Mari would also include Harry Potter. I thought for a moment, then took the tapes to the VCR and began to watch. Both were taped showing Harry and Marie having sex. The earlier one, judging by Marie's haircut, was taken in a room I didn't recognize, possibly Harry's house. The more recent one was made in my own bedroom. I wonder when Marie had this opportunity, and it occurred to me that I had had several business trips over the past year, and perhaps she was leaving the children with her parents. Overall, the tone of the recordings confirmed Harry's sexual dominance over Marie and her passionate willingness to submit. The lighting wasn't that bright, although they were both clearly visible, but the sound was amazingly good, and I could hear every word, every moan. On the first tape, from the very beginning of their affair, I heard Harry giving commands. First, he sat on the bed and ordered Marie to give him a sexy striptease, which she did with a smile. The sex was rough, not gentle or affectionate, and he spoke roughly to her. I was sad to see that Marie clearly liked what she was getting. The second tape had almost the same sex scenes, but some new, interesting dialogue. They were lying on the bed. Marie asked Harry why he didn't mind me raising his children, and he Bill is a nice enough guy, and as you say, he loves children. I have three of them, and I don't care any more than to worry. If it weren't for that, he continued, I would just tell you to leave him. What is he good for besides changing diapers? It's not fair, Harry, Marie said. Bill is a good and sweet person. He truly loved me and was a great provider for me and the children. And that's why you let me have fun with you all these years, right? She smiled at him and lightly hit him on the arm. You've never been as gentle and kind to me as Bill, and that's probably why I like you so much. Yes, baby, I treat you the way you want. Now let's get on with it before I have to leave. After finishing watching both films, I sat down and thought how arrogant they both are, not only to make these notes, but to be foolish enough to leave them in Harry's notes where I could find them. My revenge will be total, and it will be on both of them. I used a scanner to scan each note onto my hard drive. Then, using some fancy software I borrowed from work for a project I did last summer, I converted each of the videotapes into a digital file on my hard drive so I could come back to them later to edit them. When I was done, I took the records and tapes to the trunk of my car, hiding them under the spare tire. Finally, I cleaned up the attic, carefully putting everything in its place so that Marie wouldn't know I was there. Over the next two weeks, I systematically made and carried out my plans. It was much easier for me than I expected to be completely false towards Marie, to act as if nothing unusual had happened. It occurred to me that she had been deceiving me for six years, so why should I have a hard time doing the same to her? So I was sweet and loving, took care of the children, was affectionate with Marie as before, and even asked her for sex a couple of times but I tried to do it carefully so that it would be easier for her to tell me no. I really had no desire to touch her ever again. An important day in Mary's life was approaching. She has been elected as the new president of the Key Society, an important charity in our city, and will officially take office at a luncheon where she will give a speech outlining the charity's plans for the coming year. Marie served on the Key Society board for three years and was greatly honored to be named president. She was nervous about her presentation and asked me to help make the PowerPoint portion she planned to use. This was my golden opportunity. For a week or so, I worked with her every evening, letting her show me her slides and other materials and organize them into a smooth presentation. She practiced this several times in the month leading up to her big night, and it always went well. At the same time, I made my own completely different PowerPoint presentation, and it was ready to replace it the night before dinner. I deleted Mary's file and put mine in its place. I also added a lock so that once the file starts running, she can't disable it. 
All I had to do was make sure that Mary had invited Harry and his wife to dinner. I casually asked her. Yes, she said they would be there on that big night. I was as excited as Marie, although for different reasons. We got there early and Marie, elegantly dressed in a black evening dress, looked stunning. I helped her set up the laptop and did a couple of tests to make sure it would play. We all enjoyed a good dinner and some opening speeches. Marie was then warmly introduced by the outgoing president and she walked to the podium looking shy but proud. As everyone applauded, she started talking and launched the PowerPoint file. At first he behaved as she expected, showing photographs of the society's key charitable projects and then pie charts of income and expenses. Then, as I had planned, he suddenly changed the subject. First there was a series of still photographs, frames I selected from two videos of a couple having sex in different positions. Some of the photographs were a little dark, but the general impression of 10 or 12 of them confirmed that they were Marie and Harry. Marie continued to talk about key social matters for a few minutes. Then, noticing the sudden murmur of the audience, she turned around and looked at the screen behind her. She gasped and with a sharp movement of her hand, knocked over a glass of water onto the podium. For a moment she stood motionless in complete shock. Then a bright red blush quickly covered her entire face and neck, and she began frantically pressing buttons on her laptop, desperately hoping that the file would stop playing. By then, still photographs had given way to short video clips. How are you going to stop Bill from finding out that I knocked you up? As long as I let him have sex from time to time, he won't suspect anything. And Harry said, but not too much, baby, you belong to me. There was noise in the room. Laughter and hooting could be heard from all the tables. Marie stood there in complete shock and disbelief, too stunned at this point to even be embarrassed. At the next table, Caroline, Harry's wife, took a vase of flowers, smashed it over Harry's head, and left the room amidst laughter and shouting. People gradually filed out of the ballroom, looking back at Marie, gesturing to each other as they reenacted the amazing scene. Surprisingly soon, Marie and I were left alone. She stood defeated and lost on the podium. I sat at the table ten feet away from her, smiling widely and looking up at her. Finally she raised her eyes and looked at me with an expression of terrible sadness. Bill, how could you do this to me? I thought you loved me under the circumstances. I found her question funny. I burst out laughing and walked out the door, still laughing. No, no, of course not. It wasn't like that at all. It was a good fantasy, but it couldn't happen. The whole town will know that Harry is the father of my children and I will lose them in the divorce, and besides, they will hate to be known as Marie's bastards. No, I should have been more subtle. And I did it first. I visited a divorce attorney I knew several times and worked with him to prepare some documents for when I needed them. I then created the exact PowerPoint file I had just described. But I didn't wait until Mary's dinner night to reproduce it. Instead, I set it up and cooked it for Marie. One night, for weeks before dinner in the evening, when the children went to bed, I called Marie, honey, I want you to come and look at the draft of the PowerPoint file I made for your speech next month. Can't it wait, Bill? She asked angrily. Today I'm dead tired. No, honey, I said firmly. I need to see what changes are required so that I have time to make them. Please remember that I do all this for you in my free time. This brought her into the office, where I sat her down in front of the computer. Just press the letter O when you're ready and the file will run on its own, I said, smiling to myself. I watched her carefully. Everything went well at first, and she practiced her remarks on the first few key slides of the society. Then she gasped, and her face paled as she saw still images of her and Harry having sex. She turned to me, mouth wide open, but didn't make a sound. I just looked at her, expressionless. Then came video clips of them talking about how he was the father of her children and kept me in the dark. And more sex scenes. 
By this time, Marie was desperately trying to stop the file, but I blocked it. Then the screen went dark. All this took about two minutes. Marie sat limp in the chair, head down. She couldn't bring herself to look at me. I quietly enjoyed every moment of her suffering. She finally spoke, raising her head to look at me. In five minutes she aged twenty years. Bill! Me? I don't know, Bill. I'm so sorry. She started crying. I'm really sorry. Can you ever forgive me? Forgive you? I asked coldly. For what? Well, let's see. Because you had an affair with Harry Dorner, which seems to have been going on for the last six years that we've been married. For bearing him two children and letting me think they were mine. For laughing at me and speaking contemptuously about me behind my back. For refusing me sex at Harry's insistence. Do you want me to forgive you for this? Now she was sobbing even more. Bill, I don't love him. You are the person I love. The person I have always loved. My anger was cold, restrained. I didn't say anything, but I thought, no, Marie, this is bullshit. You love our life together. You like how I do everything for you, how I take care of the children. But you don't love me. No woman can love her husband and behave behind his back the way you do. I sat back and let her cry. I was very pleased to see this and I did not say a word during the 20 minutes it took her to cry. Finally she sobbed several times. She wiped her face with her hands and looked at me. What are you going to do, Bill? Are you going to divorce me? No, Marie, I won't do that. I lied. I care too much about Katie and Brian, even if they are other people's children. I let the words hang in the air for a moment, then continued. But here everything will be completely different. You can be sure. Let's start right now. Call that asshole Harry and tell him to be here in 15 minutes. She looked at me in horror. But I can't do this. He's at home with his wife and children. He will not come. I smiled. Say whatever you need, but call him here. You can tell him from me that if he does not appear here in 15 minutes, then tomorrow his marriage will be dissolved. She looked at me, perhaps afraid of the coldness on my face. Then, without saying another word, she went to the kitchen and called her lover. When Harry appeared, he gave me the soft, insincere smile I was expecting. Marie must have told him what had happened, and he looked worried and worried. Come into the office and sit down, Harry. And you too, Marie. We need to talk about something. As soon as we sat down, I started. Okay, Harry, here's the thing. You've been having fun with Marie for a very long time and making me look like a fool. It's over now. Everything has changed and it's time for you to pay for it. He started to answer, but I cut him off. Sit, watch, and listen. I scrolled through the PowerPoint file and was delighted to see him gasp in horror at what it contained when the file stopped. There was a long, surprising silence. I think I liked it more than they did. Now you will do what I tell you, exactly what I tell you, or your happy marriage to Caroline will end suddenly and publicly. Understood? Don't say a word. Just nod your head. He nodded reluctantly, looking angry. Fine. Now listen to me and keep your mouth shut. I have a number of documents that you need to sign. I will give them to you one by one. You may want your lawyer to look at them, so I'm giving you 48 hours to return them to me signed, or Caroline will be invited to a short video viewing. The first basically says that you acknowledge that you are the biological father of Katie and Brian and that you agree to pay child support for them until they turn 21, plus a lump sum for college. The amounts are listed right. $10,000 per child per year plus $100,000 per child in the fall of their first year of college. The money will be placed in a trust fund of which I am the sole trustee and I am authorized to use it as I see fit for the needs of the two children. 
Harry jumped out of his chair in anger. Listen, Bill, this is complete absurdity. I have no intentions. I pushed him back into the chair. Shut the fuck up, Harry, you have money and we both know it very well. This is not your show anymore. It's mine and you have no choice. Now shut up until I tell you that you can talk. I saw Marie looking at me from across the room with some kind of horror on her face. This was a side of her loving husband that she had never seen before. The second document gives me your permission to adopt two children. You and Marie will have to sign it. I will ask her to do this after you return it to me. This is the third statement in which you forever renounce your parental rights to Katie and Brian and swear never to disclose to anyone that you are their biological father. And lastly, this is a personal admission that you sexually harassed my wife in the workplace, forcing her to have an affair with you. What? Harry jumped up again. This is a complete lie. She wanted it as much as I did. Sit down, Harry, I said gloomily. Maybe so, but Marie will still sign a sexual harassment complaint against you. This is one of my conditions not to divorce her. Is that clear, Marie? I asked, turning to her. Mary looked from me to Harry with a frightened look. She didn't answer. Let me explain. I told them both. I'm not going to do anything with any of these documents. But this is my insurance, Harry, in case you ever think about abandoning your financial obligations to your two children, your two children, or in case it suddenly occurs to you that you wish someone else knew who their biological father is. I handed Marie the sexual harassment complaint my lawyer had written. Sign it, Marie! Still looking scared, she silently took the pen from my hand and signed the complaint at the bottom. Now, Harry... We are almost done with your part of today's meeting. I expect these signed documents to be back in my hands within 48 hours. You can bring them here to the house, and if you ever get some dark, crazy idea like killing me, I assure you that several copies of your incriminating notes and love notes to Marie are in a safe place, and several people have been instructed to make sure they would come to light if anything happened to me. Have questions, I concluded, looking at him contemptuously. Taking Marie by the hand, I led her back into the office and sat her down. I had never seen her like this before. She was trembling with horror. It's okay, Marie. I will never hit you. You don't need to be afraid. God, Bill, what's gotten into you? How could you do this to Harry? I looked at her with some surprise. You really don't understand, Marie. Don't you understand that what he did to you, what he did to me is wicked and wrong? She blushed. Yes, of course. It's simple. Well, you're so angry, it's like you've gone crazy. I had nothing to answer, so I was silent for a minute. Marie, I told you I won't divorce you, but our marriage sure as hell won't last the same way. From now on, everything will be completely different. Do you understand me? Of course, Ebil. I will do anything to make up for what I have. What did I do to you? She looked at me pleadingly. Okay, I said. Let's start with a couple of conditions. You will find a new job within two weeks. I will no longer allow you to see Harry every day at work. I hope this should be obvious, but you will never have any personal contact with Harry again. No touching, no kissing, no sex, no phone calls, no emails, nothing. Next, if our marriage continues, it will be on a completely different basis. I no longer want to put up with your bad mood, your coldness and indifference. I expect you to be a fun, kind and loving wife. Every day, by your behavior, you will show that you love me and are grateful for marrying me and all this wild, unbridled sexuality you shared only with Harry. I expect you to share it with me now. I look forward to seeing you in the sexy lingerie I've never seen you wear, the one hidden in the back of your drawer. I looked at her meaningfully, and she lowered her eyes in shame. 
and I expect you to be ready and willing and eager when I want to have sex. If you really love me, Marie, you have a hell of a lot of lost time to make up for. She walked across the room and knelt at my feet, wrapping her arms tightly around my legs and looking at me. I love you, Bill, more than I can express, and I'll show you how hard I promise. I looked at her, at her pale face stained with tears, at her frightened eyes. Somewhere inside me there were remnants of the love and devotion that I felt for this woman with whom I shared so much, but they were overshadowed, reduced to insignificance by my anger at her selfishness and hypocrisy. She deserved everything she was going to get. I pretended to soften a little. Listen, Marie, I said more softly. In four weeks, your big social dinner will take place. Let's use these weeks to start over, to make something new, maybe even better out of our marriage. If all goes well, then dinner will be our chance to celebrate the success of our new endeavor. What do you say? She nodded at me, tightening her grip on my legs. Yes, Bill. Thank you. Thanks for giving me a chance. And that will be what you want me to be. I pulled her towards me, and she cried and kissed my lips and face again and again. Now give me ten minutes to clean myself up a little, and then I'll start making amends, she said, standing up and smiling. She left the room and I sat back in my chair, grinning to myself, watching Marie twist herself into a pretzel, trying to please me. For the next four weeks is going to be a lot of fun. I was a little surprised that she didn't notice what I didn't do. I didn't ask her anything about the affair, how it started, etc. The whole evening must have been such a shock to her that she didn't have time to think about it. But of course I didn't ask because I simply didn't care. I was done with Marie. She just didn't know it yet. When I entered the bedroom a few minutes later, the bed had been made, the lights were dimmed, and Marie was lying on her side in an incredibly revealing red nightgown. She washed her face, combed her hair, and fixed her makeup. She looked amazing, as beautiful as ever. She also looked very nervous, and I noticed that there was a bottle of lube on the nightstand. Where are you? She said in a sexy voice, but with a slight tremble in her voice. Come to me. She extended her arms towards me, and I quickly took off my clothes and hugged her. We started kissing. Her body was hot, and she wriggled like a snake. Whether it was pure play, I enjoyed it. I found myself quite capable of putting aside the rage and disgust I felt towards Marie and immersing myself in pleasure with her. She had a beautiful body and her impatience was exciting, especially after so many years of indifference. I rolled onto my back and let her take the lead, which she seemed happy to do. When she was done, she turned off the light and snuggled up to me under the blanket. She gently kissed my neck and said, Sleep well. As I fell into a contented sleep, I looked forward to receiving the same attention over the next four weeks. I really enjoyed the following weeks as Marie put all her energy into rebuilding our marriage. The next morning, she woke me up with a cheerful smile and a loving kiss, asking if I would like some below the belt. Pleasure! Before scrambled eggs and bacon, I enjoyed breakfast, watching with interest as Marie did more than her usual job of preparing the children for their days. That evening, I came home to eat an unusual meal that Marie had found a recipe for in a cookbook and decided to try to cook. Katie and Brian, who demanded hot dogs and macaroni and cheese, didn't like it. But I did, and Marie took the initiative to make sure the kids bathed and went to bed on time so the two of us could enjoy our evening. Our nightly romp in the bedroom was a pleasant change from the previous night. Marie had another sexy nighty, and we enjoyed leisurely sex. Her enthusiasm, affection, and energy were exactly the same. Despite my secret feelings, I couldn't help but notice that we acted like two happy newlyweds day after day. Mary's loving attention did not wane. She was cheerful and helpful in the mornings. And with the children and tigress in the bedroom. There are some sexy new lingerie items out there, and they're getting full approval. 
several new positions were explored, and some of them were great in every way. My life became like a happy fantasy, except, of course, that I no longer trusted my wife one iota, that beneath my happy submission to her attentions, I was filled with rage and that I was only pretending to share her loving feelings. The papers Harry signed were in my mailbox within 48 hours. As I requested, I quickly got Marie to sign the adoption consent and took it to my lawyer. That same week, he arranged a private hearing before a judge, and ten days later the legal adoption was finalized. Then my lawyer took care of the divorce papers. One morning at work, I received a surprise visit from Denise Reynolds, a colleague with whom I share projects from time to time. At 28, she was five years younger than me, and it was a real knockout. I knew she was divorced, and from time to time her remarks to me as I walked through the office seemed a little flirtatious. But I never thought much about her other than that she was almost at the top of my list of women I sleep with. In your fantasies. I expected Denise's visit to be work-related, but it wasn't. Billy, she said, what has changed in you lately? What have you been training? You seem, I don't know, younger or in better shape or something. Thank you for the compliment, Denise, I said with a smile. Then thinking, what the hell? I rushed on. Actually, something completely different, but I can't talk about it here. Maybe we can have lunch together today. Sounds great, she replied. We went to the salad bar, then took our lunches to a table in the park and enjoyed the sun while we ate. The difference in me that you noticed is probably that my marriage is in terrible shape. She looked puzzled. And that makes you look better? Explain, please. I gave her a carefully edited version of the story. A couple of weeks ago, I found out that my wife was cheating on me with a guy from work. This has been going on for a very long time. I gave him some gentle lessons to get him to leave her alone, and since then she has been doing everything she can to make it up to me. He'll tell you a secret, Denise. Marie thinks she can get me back, but Eve already decided that in a few weeks I won't be with her. I can't live with a woman who betrayed me like that. In the meantime, she treats me like a king, both in and out of the bedroom. That's the difference. You notice today she looked at me appraisingly. I'm impressed that you're doing so well. When I found out my ex was cheating on me, I almost fell apart. It took several months before I regained my peace of mind. I'm very sorry, I said. I didn't know you went through this. But at the moment I have taken control of my situation. It will develop the way I want, not someone else. This makes me feel much better saying what the hell to myself again. I, one of the nice things about my situation is that even though I'm not officially single yet, I know I will be soon. So I don't have to restrain myself from expressing my admiration for the very nice lady sitting with me in the park today. And I looked at her smiling. She blushed slightly and looked away, then looked back at me. Lord, Bill, you managed to put me in an awkward position. I didn't think it was so simple. Sorry, Denise, but you are so beautiful and so funny. I've been attracted to you since we met. It's just that until now it was forbidden to talk about it. Any chance you'll have dinner with me on Saturday? I know a nice little Italian place overlooking the river. She looked at me very seriously. Bill, I like you too, and it was always easy with you. Can I trust you? Is your marriage really over or is this just some bullshit to get into my pants? Forgive me, but I've seen this scene before. Denise, I have always been frank with you and as you know, I have never pestered you before. I'm breaking up with Marie in about two weeks and will be filing for divorce that same day. There is no turning back. But I understand if you want to push me away, I'll just be a little disappointed. She smiled. No, Bill. Now that you've made me an offer, I'm ready to accept it before you change your mind. She looked at me intently and I hesitated a little. Lean forward and we kissed lightly and tenderly. 
It wasn't a hot, sexy kiss, but it felt like a wonderful promise. When it was over, I smiled at her like a happy child. When I told my wife I had a date on Saturday night, it certainly brought out the bastard in me. I made it clear that I would be going out with another woman and that I expected her to stay home with the kids. Bill, Marie was shocked and seemed ready to cry. But, but I tried so hard. Think of something to save our marriage. How can you see someone else? It's very simple, Marie. Not only did you see someone else, but you also had sex with him behind my back for six years. You've been amazing lately, and I'm feeling a lot better. But that doesn't mean you deserve my complete devotion. It seems pretty obvious that I'm going to have to have fun with someone else for quite some time before we're even. She started to cry a little. Will you sleep with her? No. But I can. And this is exactly what you have to come to terms with. If this makes you feel terrible... Well, this will help you understand how you made me feel. And with that, I ended the conversation by leaving the room. My first dates with Denise were delightful but cautious. We took our time. Both of us probably felt that we were experiencing something more than just sexual attraction to each other. We chatted and laughed, complained about our co-workers, told stories about growing up, and just got to know each other. It was convenient and easy. It even sometimes reminded me of my first days with Marie. The thought saddened me, but I pushed it away. After our third dinner, as I opened Denise's car door outside her apartment, she quietly asked, Do you want to come in? We both knew what it meant, and I was instantly horny. When we walked inside, she was immediately in my arms, and we were kissing and hugging like two teenagers. She pulled away from me a little and said, Seriously, I really want this, Bill, but I'm very nervous. It's been a long time. Please be gentle with me and take your time. Of course, I said with a smile, gently picking her up. Which way is your bedroom? Sex with Denise was amazing, but completely different from what I had with Marie lately. She was a little shy at first. She was quite passive, allowing me to stroke and caress her breasts and body. But she was so gorgeous that I enjoyed every part of her. Our first sex was relaxed, soft, gentle. It was infinitely more loving than the sporty sex I had with Marie. It was actually like two people who care about each other, making each other happy. When we finished, Denise kissed me several times and asked if I could stay the night. I happily agreed, and we fell asleep in each other's arms. The next morning, she was a little embarrassed again, and we did not make love, but said goodbye with sincere tenderness and kissed tenderly several times. There were only a few days left until my big wedding night with Marie. I did not reveal my plans to Denise, but I told her that I would be officially divorced very soon and would be on my way to getting a divorce. When I walked through the door around 930 that Saturday morning, Marie was quietly crying at the kitchen table. It was obvious how I had spent the previous night, pretending to sympathize with her more than I felt. I hugged her tenderly. I'm sorry, Marie. I know how you feel. Believe me. God, Bill, this is just terrible. The very thought of you in another woman's bed tears me apart. I've been so selfish all these years. How could I not think about you and how my novel would make you feel? She looked at me and said, Thank you. Thank you for giving me another chance. Mary's great night like mine was quickly approaching. To some extent, I almost regretted it. The last four weeks with Marie, including very qualitative sex, were a lot of fun and I will miss them. But the thing was, nothing she did even began to cool my resentment and anger. Her complete betrayal went far beyond what she could do to make amends. When I looked into my heart, there was only a tiny thimble of love for her and only a tiny drop of sympathy for what was about to happen to her. While working with her on a PowerPoint presentation for her speech, I also secretly prepared my own version, not exactly the one she saw as I needed to hide Harry's identity and the fact that he was the children's father. 
but the general approach was the same. First a series of photographs and then some wonderful videos. I set up the laptop so that Mary's presentation would play every time she used it. But by pressing a key combination including of course I could lock her presentation and replace it with my own special file. Both in the days leading up to the dinner and that evening, Marie fearfully asked me if I had deleted that horrible file that had played for her four weeks ago. Each time with a loving smile, I would reassure her that it was gone, and I would go to the laptop and show her that her presentation was there and would play with the click of a button. The last few days at home have been especially sweet. Marie was beginning to feel more confident that she was winning me over again, and her loving attention seemed calmer and somehow less desperate at the same time. The pain she felt when I spent the whole night with Denise made her rise even higher in our bed. Knowing that this was all about to end, I enjoyed every moment. When the big night arrived, we were there early, me in a rented tuxedo, Marie looking glamorous in a black evening dress with spaghetti straps that showed off her neck and shoulders. We ran her PowerPoint presentation through twice so she was confident everything was fine. As she leaned over to place her purse under the podium, I quickly entered the key combination, ending in a everything was in place and everything went exactly as I expected. We had a good dinner, chatting amicably with our friends around the table. There were a few dull greetings. Then Marie was warmly introduced by the outgoing president, and she nervously walked to the podium to the sound of general applause. According to my watch, her excitement and happiness lasted exactly 54 seconds. That's how much time passed between the start of the PowerPoint file and the moment her audience started seeing still photos of her cheating. Marie did not freeze or knock over the glass of water, but she turned and stared at me with horror and disbelief in her eyes before desperately trying to stop the file from playing. Of course, she failed. When the video clips started and their sound filled the room, she just stood there, slouched beat red, looking at the floor, and she did not make the slightest movement. When the surprise of the audience gave way to indignation mixed with laughter and did not react in any way to obscene cries sent to her by someone from the retreating crowd. A few minutes later, we were alone. I sat quietly, looking at her from my place at the table. Finally, she spoke a question for my fantasy. Bill, how could you do this to me? I thought you loved me. Yes, Marie, I answered her. Over the past few weeks, I have loved you just as much as you loved me six years before. I walked up to the podium and placed several folded sheets of paper in her hand. I'm divorcing you. Consider yourself served. If you stay in town, you'll get joint custody of Katie and Brian. Otherwise, they'll fight you for full custody and you know it'll win. Having almost reached the door, I heard her scream in anger and pain. But you said you wouldn't divorce me. You said we could try to figure it out. I turned around and looked at her. Yes, Marie, I said. So I guess after all these years of you lying to me, I lied to myself. You 45, subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you. And go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.